Hey everybody, Steve Kozar here. I'm placing a video on my channel here from Dawn Hill. I'm just copying and pasting it with her permission. I'm going to maybe add a few comments, but mostly this is just her video. She did a great job of very carefully addressing a critique that Isaiah Saldivar did of the American Gospel trailer without really having done his homework ahead of time. And he will admit that. Um, but he has a huge channel. He has a very, very big, growing YouTube channel. Five million views in just the last month. So it's really important that we take people like him and really consider how knowledgeable are they? How reliable are they as sources of doctrinal truth? Isaiah comes across as very energetic, very confident, uh, very sure of himself. And yet, what was promising is that he did watch Dawn's video and in a very short time responded by admitting that uh, she did a great job. There's a lot of things he got wrong. He didn't really do his research and he will do better in the future. So that was very encouraging to see. Dawn is in this trailer and so is my wife and myself. We are all involved in this project and uh, I'm actually doing some of the research behind the scenes on an ongoing basis for this entire project. So we're deeply involved in this project because we really believe in the importance of being good Bereans and trying to decipher good teaching from bad teaching. This is Dawn's YouTube channel. I highly recommend you subscribe to it. And I want to also recommend that you listen to a interview that my wife and I did with Dawn last year. It's one of the best things we've ever put on our channel. So I highly encourage you to listen to that too. Okay, now here is Dawn's video. There's another movie coming out. It's not coming out in theaters, and I'm not trying to throw shade, but there's another movie coming out called American Gospel. Let's go to here. American Gospel Spirit and Fire Extended uh, Preview. So we're going to watch the extended the version. I don't know if it's good or bad. It's the first one. I, I, I wouldn't recommend watching them, to be honest with you. The first one, it was very leaning towards cessationism, very against, in my opinion, very biased against the charismatic movement, against... You know, they're mainly trying to say they're against prosperity gospel, but they tied in a lot of like miracle signs and wonders. They always tie that in, which by the way, charismatics are not the same as word of faith. They're not the same as prosperity. We don't preach prosperity gospel. We don't preach word of faith. That's completely different, but they try to tie everyone together. So th this is what they're saying about this documentary coming out. We're going to watch the trailer and I'm going to give you my thoughts. And I hate to quench what God's doing at Asbury because a lot of these people that are like cessationist driven are against revival they're like revival is not the answer um they're saying this is a very how do i say it non-biased documentary they're saying there are other ones were for sure biased let's be honest but they're saying this one's non-biased we're gonna have like dr michael brown who's amazing love dr michael brown we've had him on the show he's a charismatic and then they brought on some other charismatics to basically try to be like you know give a fair shake to the charismatics but in my opinion with the way this trailer is edited and done it's 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 definitely trying to throw shade at the charismatics. Let's Have just be honest. This? I've seen parts of this trailer, but I'm going to react to it. Hey, y'all. I normally don't do videos like this, and I may start to do more now. Um, but I wanted to do this one in particular, and I appreciate you jumping on here today to watch this video. And I hope that it's helpful. And the audience that I want to reach is not only you all that are my subscribers and listen to my podcast and watch the videos that I put out. But I also want to reach out to a particular following, um, those that follow Isaiah Saldivar. The reason why I'm making this video, it's a reaction video to a reaction video that he recently did. And I doubt that he'll see this and it really doesn't matter. I hope that he would see this and consider the things that I'm going to say. And I want to be kind and patient, um, yet firm and loving in this video because there were things that were said recently that I feel like as someone who's involved in this particular project, I want to say something yet again. I did say something in a recent podcast episode that I did, and if you wanna check that out, you can. It was called Deliverance Hits the Big Screen. And the thing that I addressed in there was in regards to a recent Facebook post that Alexander Pagani had done, and he made the statement, and of course he took it down, but he made the statement on his Facebook page that the Deliverance movie was a response to American Gospel bloviating about charismatics, and he put clap back. So as I said in the podcast the other day, this is not a clap back. Where are you going? I'm going to pick a fight. <laughs> but this is to provide clarification. Because unfortunately, in the reaction video that Isaiah did recently about American Gospel, Spirit and Fire, 
he did not fill you guys in, you followers, on the actual information about this movie, this docu-series. And I want to be kind enough to provide you the information that you were not provided the other day. And so with that, we are going to look at his reaction and I'm going to stop it along the way. And as we do, I'm gonna provide you the information that you need and provide some observations, food for thought, on this reaction video. So with that, let's get started. Oh, I have some notes I'm gonna to refer to. And I'm not as high tech as everybody else is, but I am going to try to do my best and do this in excellence. So the first thing I want to address is right out of the gate. The point that Isaiah makes is that he addresses the American Gospel series. In case you don't know, this is the third installment in the American Gospel series. The first one was called American Gospel Christ Alone. And that film did deal with the Word of Faith teaching. And it also mentioned Bethel. And that's the reason why he's probably uh, mentioning about the signs and wonders because Bethel was mentioned. Now, if you know anything about the Word of Faith and the Prosperity Gospel, and you've had any time in the charismatic church, then you're going to know that there is some bleed over. There are elements of Word of Faith and the Prosperity Gospel in areas of the charismatic church. This is coming from someone who was in a particular area of the charismatic movement, which we are gonna get to that in just a moment about American Gospel 3 or American Gospel Spirit and Fire. But the charismatic church has elements of Word of Faith in it. It has elements of uh, Prosperity Gospel in it. Depending on who you talk to, there are some charismatics that will reject the things of the Word of Faith and they will reject the Prosperity Gospel. But having said that, there are areas in the charismatic church that have embraced these teachings. That is the reason why for bringing them up. And so I do disagree with Isaiah on that statement about charismatics and not having elements of Word of Faith in there or Prosperity Gospel. Again, not all charismatics may hold to that, but it is but those are elements that are involved in the charismatic church that you will see. And Bethel is going to be one that you see that is embracing these types of teachings because they embrace signs and wonders, which is why that was mentioned. And again, you'll see elements in Bethel. If you do take any time to look and see what Bethel teaches, you will notice that there is word of faith involved in that. There's prosperity gospel involved in that with some of their declarations that they do for their offering when they take it up. So there's a reason why those things were mentioned. The second installment of American Gospel was called Christ Crucified, and Isaiah did not mention that one, and I'm not even sure if he watched it because he's saying he recommends not to watch them. Uh, it's kind of hard to recommend something um, if you haven't fully researched it out and know anything of what it's about. Now, with their deliverance ministry, I don't know about their film, but if it's anything like the YouTube videos that they do, then you're gonna have a good representation of what is gonna be going on with this. That's a whole other topic for another day. But with the second installment of American Gospel, it was called Christ Crucified. And in that, they address the humanistic and also the progressive Christianity aspect of the emergent church and compared it with the biblical Christianity, the biblical gospel, and showed the correlation with that. Now, what you're gonna notice in their films, the first film, they had several people that uh, denied or declined to be interviewed for the first installment of American Gospel, and they actually noted that in the documentary. In the second one, they had at least four different opposing views compared to the biblical Christianity that's been, um, that most of us know, but they had four different interviews that they conducted that agreed with um, humanistic, secular humanism or progressive Christianity. So what you're going to see if you watch the American Gospel films is that they are presenting the opposing views because they want to be fair and objective. I understand that Isaiah said that um, he's, he's making a note of saying, well, people are saying this is unbiased, but it's really biased. And quite frankly, we all have biases, including him. Um, and so I don't know with their deliverance min uh, de their deliverance film that's coming out in March. I don't know if there's dissenting opinions in there. Um, if it's not, then it's going to be heavily biased, um, in my opinion, to not have that opposing view. So um, there are going to be biases across the board. And so the the goal of American Gospel Spirit and Fire is to focus on a specific area. He keeps saying that it's going to be an attack on charismatics. I want to clear that up for you while we're on here today because he didn't do his homework. And I'm not saying that in a mean way, but he didn't do his homework. He hasn't read the synopsis and he doesn't know what this is about. There's claims that he's making that tell me he hasn't done the research and he doesn't know where what he's talking about. So let's keep going. But they're definitely trying to say, 
you know, every, all the charismatics are the same and we're all, you know, we're all weirdos and stuff like that, which we're definitely not. So and let me also clarify that nobody in this film, to my knowledge, says that all charismatics are a bunch of weirdos. Let's watch this and then I'll give you guys my thoughts and we'll pause it and we'll talk and everything like that. I know you don't know a lot about this like, movie, I don't know. but yeah, I'll, I'll give some commentary here. So with Reading, our, you know, our three major economic engines are tourism, methamphetamine, and, you know, marijuana, the drug culture, and then Bethel Church. So they start out by saying, oh, no. yes, that's what I'm saying. They, and again, I know the makers of this are going to watch this. I know the creators are going to watch this and they're going to say, oh, well, it's non-biased. Dude, you can't start your trailer saying there's methamphetamine whatever and then bethel is like the tr is like what's happening is the you know i know what they're trying to say they're trying to say like people come to writing for bethel but it's just not a good way to start bethel church there. is no remember this is supposed to be their claim to american gospel non-biased they're trying to say they're non-biased but let's just globally people come to bethel from all over the nation and the world for healing they say that the the anointing is stronger here a couple who attends Bethel Mega Church in Reading is getting national attention for asking Christians to pray for the resurrection of their two-year-old daughter who died unexpectedly. Yeah, that. So they they stood and believed for this girl who died to come back to life, and they got so much heat. Everyone said you shouldn't do that. Yeah. You should let let the parents grieve. The parents were the ones leading the charge leading on worship. this, leading the worship, praying for their daughter to be raised from the dead. And now they're going to use this story to say we're a bunch of crazy charismatics. Let, wow, let me be clear on a few things so before sad. I start this, um, my, my response or my review of this trailer is I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, promote Bethel at all. I don't promote their theology. I don't send people there. I'm not against them, but I'm definitely not in promotion of like, Bethel and stuff. Cause I don't know them. I don't know what they're doing. I don't, I've never been there. So this is not a promotion of Bethel at all, but I think it's really sad to take a bunch of these clips and use them in your documentary and basically be like, look at these crazy charismatics, which by the way, the people that they are going to make look like scholars in this documentary are people that absolutely hate charismatics. Okay. So Isaiah says that there's people in this film that actually hate charismatics. Does he know that for certain? Um, just because somebody's teaching is actually called into question doesn't mean that that person is hated. When someone's teaching is called into question, that's a biblical principle that's being done. And it's out of concern for other people, to, for those who are professing believers are hearing the truth of the word. And it's done out of concern. Now, there may be times that people are, are more forceful with what they're saying, and they come across as more direct or blunt about it. Um, I will speak for myself. I don't hate charismatics. I don't hate anyone, which that's a sin, by the way. And there's things that Isaiah's done the past of encouraging jealousy in other people um, that he would hope that pastors are jealous because of this deliverance ministry, because of what they're, they think is going to take place or what they say is going to take place. And that's calling people to act in a sinful way. It's encouraging sinful behavior. So I wanted to point that out and to help you understand if you're following Isaiah Saldivar or some of these other demon slayers, I want you to know something. I don't hate you. I can't speak for anybody else. But to make that claim, you're assuming that you know the motives and the heart of people and that you know their thoughts about you. And that's presumption and that's not okay. So to presume that we hate people because we actually say something and call things into question is incorrect. And some of the guys on this documentary have made videos about me where they literally say the meanest things you could think of about me because I believe in miracles and deliverance. Some of the people that are interviewing this documentary. So this is a type of straw man argument where you say there's people in this film who are really mean. They're mean to me. And why are they mean to me? Well, because I believe in miracles and I believe in healing for today and they don't. That's actually not the argument. I'm pretty sure he's referring to the videos that Chris Roseboro has made in just the past year. And those videos are very critical of Isaiah's teaching, his unbiblical teaching. It's not being mean, it's being a Berean. But when Isaiah claims that certain people are being mean to him and having a mean-spiritedness, I think there might be two things going on. One is he's trying to create sympathy for himself with his audience, and he's also trying to tell his audience, don't even bother listening to those people, those critical people. Why? Because they're mean. And I think sometimes people do this because it's easier than trying to carefully answer very difficult arguments. You just brush the whole thing aside by saying, well, that's a mean person, so we can ignore the actual content of what they're saying. 
So there are a lot of them. There's a lot of mean spirited, uh, mean spiritedness in the in the cessationist movement and in the God doesn't move anymore movement or gifts aren't for today or miracles aren't for today. And at one side, they say you know we're true to the Bible, but the other side they're not true to the Bible because they don't believe in what the Bible teaches. So he said that the other side that opposes what he's saying. Uh, basically doesn't believe what the Bible teaches. Again, these are blanketed statements that are made. There's no scripture to back these up. And you don't know. <laughs> if you're just basing it on what your opinion is and what you think and you have no scripture to back it up and you haven't listened to any of the teachings that have been done or the rebuttals that have been done or the questions that have been asked and you don't want to have a, a conversation with somebody that, that opposes your view, then you really have nothing to say on the matter. Um, and again, I say that with all loving kindness, but also just being direct about it, being being honest and forthcoming about that. If you don't want to have that conversation, there's not much that we can do about that. Um, I want to acknowledge some things here and provide you with some clarity. He's giving pushback because right out of the gate that Bethel is... Uh, brought to the forefront in this in this extended trailer and I want to point something out that should be quite obvious Bethel is a global church as far as its impact and its influence on many other churches it has had tremendous impact there's many people all over the world that know Bethel when you say Bethel Church they know who that is the church that I was once part of for almost 20 years we incorporated um, several of Bethel's teachings, including about prophetic ministry, intercessory prayer, reading uh, Bill Johnson's books at times, face to face with God when heaven invades earth. So this is not a small movement. And a lot of us have been influenced by Bethel's music. I know I was for years as a worship leader that I led worship to Bethel, Jesus Culture, um, Hillsong, Elevation. So there was a lot of reach with that. And to say and to make it seem like, well, it's not a big deal. Why are you uh, talking about Bethel right off the bat? Because people know that name and it's quite popular. And so this is the reason why. And it's also affiliated with what the whole point of, of uh, American Gospel Spirit and Fire is about. Um, regarding Wake Up Olive, I actually, uh, I came out of this movement in 2019, at uh, about May of 2019. At the end of 2019 was when this happened in December, and quite frankly, I was, I was disturbed by what I saw going on. And um, to say, to downplay what happened and to say they were praying, they were not praying. They were not praying. If you actually go and look at the footage, and it, it's heartbreaking to me as a mother, it's heartbreaking. Um, I cannot imagine losing my two-year-old. I would certainly pray and I would ask God um, for healing and such, but I also understand that what prayer is now. And I didn't when I was in this movement. I thought I did, but I didn't. And what they were doing was not prayer, y'all. It was decreeing and declaring. And that's not a biblical model for prayer. If you look in scripture and you study that out, you're going to take note of how we are to pray. And it's not in decreeing and declaring, putting a command or a demand on the word or, or putting demands and out there into the atmosphere. It's nothing like that. We are to petition God and to ask and to trust him regardless of what we see in prayer and to know that God is faithful. Um, he's good. He's holy. He's worthy of our praise and glory no matter what happens. So I would really push back on what Isaiah said with that. It was not prayer. Not in the slightest was it prayer. Um, and that's something that needs to be acknowledged. As far as being mean-spirited and biased, I hope that Isaiah will be willing to look at his own conduct and his own behavior and the things that he says um, and to really personally evaluate himself to see if, if he's projecting um, to see if he is actually acting in the same way that he's criticizing those of us that question some of the teachings that are coming out of this type of movement, uh, which I would label hyper charismatic and American gospel spirit and fire sure does. They don't label it charismatic across the board, but we'll get there in just a little bit. But I would label it hyper charismatic. That was the, the area of the charismatic church I was involved in and new apostolic reformation which is not a conspiracy theory, by the way. You're going to hear that in just a moment. And then you're going to find that I'm going to jump ahead because I really want to address this topic. But nevertheless, um, I hope that he will uh, will gauge that uh, in his own conduct 
and um, maybe consider the fact when you call people Pharisees and critical uh, religious spirits and such because of questioning that um, you you are likely guilty of the same uh, behavior and conduct that you don't like having done towards you. Like cessationism is not a biblical doctrine. It's a, it's literally a false doctrine because the Bible doesn't teach it. Like in a literal sense, saying the gifts aren't for today is a, is a false. So if my daughter died, I would pray for her to be raised from yeah, the dead. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And God's going to do what he's going to do. Yeah. But you're going to pray. pray. Yeah. We believe. Are we crazy for believing that? No. I mean, we believe, we believe the it. Bible. Yeah. We believe the Bible. It happened in the Bible. It happened to Lazarus. I after would pray three and days. I would hope everybody else would pray. Yeah, so they're they're gonna use that, and I know a lot of the cessationists have and been like, so it's so sad. wrong that these parents prayed for their dead baby. It's like, well, just because you don't guys don't believe in miracles doesn't what mean you don't. What parents wouldn't? But yeah, this is not to advocate for Bethel. Again, uh, I'm unbiased when it comes to this, but this documentary <sighs> is supposed to be unbiased, and the first 39 seconds, I already know where they're going. And saying that you know in the first 39 seconds where someone is going, you are actually displaying biases yourself. And also, too, I want to just clarify that those who are cessationists. Um, actually do believe that God does miracles. There's a difference between people that consistently have the gift of miracles and believing that God still does miracles. God still does miracles and he still heals today. You may not like that answer, but God still heals and he does miracles. Um, and, and there's other things I want to uh, add to this as we go, but we'll keep going. We have a biblical precedent. Jesus raised the dead. So I went to Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, uh, did three years there, so it's a three-year program. The leaders of this movement claim to be apostles and prophets with extraordinary authority, miraculous powers. Some people locally call it the Christian Hogwarts. They charge tuition. They call it the Christian Hogwarts. So again, they're going to do their best. I don't think it's, it doesn't seem unbiased to me, but to shed you know, charismatics in a bad light. Again, we, we had revival for 10 years and we weren't laughing, shaking, falling over and doing a lot of the manifestations that you see like we out of Bethel. We weren't like weird. Yeah, oh, but, um, and not, not that, yeah, we haven't <laughs> been to Bethel, so we can't tell you, but my point is not every charismatic is this shaking, crazy word of faith, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn style, like with what they would put and say. To teach so. you how to use. Which this is Benny Hinn's nephew, I think, who's, now like goes around basically saying like how false Benny Hinn is. Or even think, received sure. the gifts of the spirit. A couple things. <laughs> so he's gotten to the point with Costi Hinn. You may or may not know of Costi Hinn. I don't know Costi Hinn personally, but he has a ministry called For the Gospel and he's actually a pastor that they've uh, established a church. Uh, he initially started in Arizona and I believe now they've established one in California. And so it's growing and, and praise the Lord. There are people coming to saving faith and they're being biblically discipled. He does not travel around to my knowledge anyway. I've watched quite a few of his videos and his sermons and even the shorts that he does for For the Gospel that have been very helpful um, in providing biblically sound teaching. And he doesn't go around focusing on uh, his, his uncle Benny Hinn and trying to tear down his ministry. He is one of the people that actually addresses um, the word of faith teaching, the prosperity gospel, and calls it for what it is. And again, if that's problematic, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. But I did want to read something to you. Um, Isaiah, uh, because of what Isaiah said, so I actually want to read to you the synopsis of American Gospel Spirit and Fire, which is set to come out not in secular theaters, and that's okay. So it's scheduled to come out in spring of this year. And so this is what the synopsis says off the American Gospel website. In Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Today, many in hyper-charismatic circles, I want you to please take note of that. Many in hyper charismatic circles use this verse to teach that a Christian should pursue a baptism of fire from the Holy Spirit. These encounters with the presence of God typically manifest in bizarre ways, including a loss of self-control, dignity, and other mystical experiences that are untethered from scripture and the gospel of Jesus Christ. American gospel, spirit and fire will examine the true person and work of the Holy Spirit, including his work in the life of Christ and his followers, and contrast this with the different spirit commonly promoted in the movement known as the New Apostolic Reformation. Now, Isaiah is going to make some comments about the NAR here in just a little bit. 
But what I want to tell you is this. If you will read this synopsis, you're going to notice it's not talking about all charismatics. It's talking about a specific area within the charismatic movement that's more hyper charismatic and also the new apostolic reformation. Please take note of that because he is con he's going to continue to blanket every charismatic into this film and in doing so it's creating that bias to get you to not watch this film and you can watch it or not watch it that is your choice whether you decide to do that or not but i would just recommend that you take into account the actual information provided to you about this and the reason why i'm saying something is because i'm actually featured in this project and i know what it's about and i know some of the people that are featured in it and I know what they're going to talk about. So this is going to be presented in a fair and objective way. It is difficult to see people, I'm, I'll be honest with you, it is difficult to see people in this film that I, I do not agree with that are opposing views. But I also understand that it's important to represent this, this film and this project fairly and objectively. And part of being fair and objective is to show what goes on in the hyper charismatic movement. You may think it's extreme and it's the most extreme cases, but frankly, this is stuff that I saw for years that went on. Um, this is not uncommon behavior that, that's being shown in these films. And anybody who's come out of the hyper charismatic movement is going to tell you the exact same thing. So just wanted to share that with you. And I also wanted to let you know that as far as this project is concerned, they've been working on this the third installment since 2019. So five years this has been going on. They've interviewed over 70 people and there's seven roundtable discussions that are going to be featured in this docu-series. So it is a big project. It has not been slapped together and thrown together to make it look like something, some monstrosity in a short period of time or to um, wag fingers at or to call people weirdos. This is an extensive project that has had a lot of care done to it. The director has been very mindful in what he has been doing and how he's represented people and been very fair and objective. And so I think it's really important that we do our homework before we start critiquing something. Uh, if we're going to critique it, which is fair to do, then we need to do our homework and make sure that we do our research on a project. They are part of a movement called the New Apostolic Reformation. This NAR thing is basically a conspiracy theory. Yeah, the NAR is a real thing. It's not a conspiracy. This guy can't stand me. This guy's made countless videos about really? me. Yes. Actually, Chris Rosebro at Fighting for the Faith has made three videos specifically about Isaiah Saldivar. And then there's one other video where a segment was about him, but that's it. Basically three and a half videos. And I want you to notice how Isaiah's co-host says, really? This guy's made countless videos about really? me. Yes. So he's getting sympathy by claiming that this mean guy is just mean. Now, whether he's mean or not, the real issue is, is Isaiah's teaching sound and biblical? Because that's really what Chris is getting at in his videos. You might even say, yeah, he's mean, but the real question is, is he right? That's being avoided by focusing on whether or not he's mean. Now, I put some clips together of one of the videos that Chris did regarding Isaiah Saldivar. And what I want you to see is what Chris really does probably better than anybody on the internet, is listen to what a teacher says in a publicly available video that's supposed to be a teaching video for the entire world to see, and he compares it very meticulously to the words of Scripture, using multiple translations and his knowledge of the original Greek language. All right, so he quotes Sins the and NLT. wonders gave him full confidence that he fully preached the gospel, and without them, the gospel is not full. Here's what the NLT says. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. And this way... In what way? By the miraculous signs and wonders. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Lyricum. In today's era of Christianity, we've lost the convincing factor. We've lost the convincing factor. The thing that was convincing people in Paul's day was the signs and wonders. No. Now, real quick, we're going to do a little comparative work here. So the text in question is Romans chapter 15. Fully preached the gospel. The text doesn't say that. So uh, Isaiah Saldivar 
is showing that he doesn't know how to rightly handle biblical texts and merely making an appeal to the NLT, the new living translation. Remember the living started off as a paraphrase and they tried to tidy it up by coming out with the NLT, which is still a, a, an abysmal mess, right? Um, the, the NLT is only a little bit better than a paraphrase, just, just a little bit, but th they they added words. So, and by the uh, the power, the dunamé pneumatas of, of the spirit, and then there's an alternative reading of the spirit of God, so that, um, so that from Jerusalem, uh, and and around Illyricum, you get the idea here. Nothing there about them being convinced that it doesn't exist in the Greek at all. So the NLT has an aberrant translation, and they've added something to the biblical text that's not there at the time. But all of that being said, there is no manuscript that says uh, that the Gentiles were convinced by signs and wonders. So Isaiah Saldivar, I, I should say very deceitfully makes an appeal to the NLT when he should be making an appeal to the original Greek text. But he can't because the original text doesn't say that. So here's where we're going to do a little bit of work, okay? We're going to talk about signs and wonders, and we're going to ask the question, are signs and wonders necessary when it comes to preaching the gospel. Okay, now I'll go back to Don's video. I really wanted you to see what kind of teaching Chris Roseborough actually does compared to the way he's being mischaracterized. He says uh, he's he's probably the rudest, one of the rudest, <gasps> rudest guys on YouTube. I'm not kidding. He's just theory. like the oh, way it is described doesn't exist. I oh, that's see. Dr. Michael stuff. Brown. So Dr. Michael Brown is standing for the Charismatics, and like that guy, them, they're like. Basically saying like we're NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, which I didn't know what that was, and apparently I'm NAR too. But it is a conspiracy theory. It's basically anyone that's charismatic or believes in miracles or pursues gifts, like the Bible says, do they basically were considered like NAR? Yeah, it's like it, it literally is, and you'll hear Dr. Brown. Yeah, so I was part of this movement for almost for 18 years, and I didn't know what the New Apostolic Reformation was. That doesn't mean that I wasn't part of it. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, so I was very ignorant about what I was part of. And it started out Word of Faith, um, the church I was part of. And if you're interested, you can check out the interviews. I'm not going to get into all the detail about myself. Today is about the American gospel and this reaction video and doing a reaction video to the reaction video. But um, the apostle that I was under, apostle that I was under for almost 18 years, um, didn't start out as an apostle. It was very much Word of Faith in the beginning. Um, very much ingrained with uh, Kenneth Hagin teachings for a long time. And also the fivefold ministry was taught to us for a number of years. And then as it progressed on, um, there was an embracing of the leader actually being an apostle himself with governing authority and also saying that apostles and prophets were necessary um, in the church and they had governing authority and um, listening to them and to what they had to say. And... Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot to that. And so when he says it's a conspiracy theory, um, I think he's misunderstood the New Apostolic Reformation because he makes the statement, Isaiah makes this statement, that any charismatic is labeled NAR, and that is not true. I'm sure that there are people that would do that, but I'm going to speak personally and tell you I don't lump every charismatic under the New Apostolic Reformation. That would be unfair to do because the um, one of the core characteristics of the New Apostolic Reformation is the belief that there are modern day apostles and prophets with governing authority. Governing authority. It's not a conspiracy theory, guys. If you do your due diligence and do your research, you're going to find that this is very much a teaching. It's not a theory. It's not some sort of church growth observation that was made by C. Peter Wagner. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> so there are charismatics that do not believe, such as the Assembly of God, they do not believe that there are modern day apostles and prophets today with governing authority. Um, so there are areas of the charismatic movement that they do not acknowledge this and I would not lump them under the New Apostolic Reformation. Now the other thing too is that um, along with this belief is that pastors must come underneath an apostle and align with an apostle in order to really be relevant. I mean, so they, they, they can uh, continue on with the Great Commission. Um, 
There's other aberrant, aberrant practices that go on that are um, correlated with the New Apostolic Reformation because you see as these apostles and prophets um, that believe they have governing authority have embraced this teaching that came from C. Peter Wagner and it continues on today no matter how many um, adjustments are made to certain websites with networks trying to scrub away um, any residue or remnant that C. Peter Wagner spoke things that they agree with. There's still elements on their websites that indicate that they do believe these teachings with governing authority. This is a hyper charismatic area of, or focus within the charismatic movement, not an attack on all charismatics. I'm reiterating that so you can understand that if you're watching and you saw this reaction video that Isaiah did. Um, and I have done my research on this. I continue to do research on this. I have books that you're gonna see, this bottom stack here, this bottom shelf, has all kinds of books for research purposes that I've done. And that shelf contains a number of New Apostolic Reformation books. And I've done research online and looked into this. There are people that have done far more research than I have for a lot longer than I have. And they know far more about it than I do. But as someone who was in it, I can tell you, it is most assuredly a real thing. Unbelievable hypercriticism. This conspiracy theory was adopted by heresy hunting evangelicals endless people damning us to eternal hell fire i mean here and that's here the am. thing these guys making videos about us they say we're going to hell they literally it's not just like oh you know he's off in his doctrine it's like this guy is a wolf he's going to hell like imagine i've lived my whole life serving god reaching people seeing the law saved but it's like we're going to hell because we believe in miracles first corinthians says to pursue gifts and we are doing that but because of that we're going to hell I'm guessing that most people can see through this, but just in case you can't, this is another one of those straw man arguments. Nobody is saying because you pursue spiritual gifts as the Bible describes that you are therefore going to hell. And that's what the well. NAR, if you're NAR, it's like, dude, you're going to hell. And that's apparently what we are. So I don't know. I, I, I am not a fan. I'm just going to be honest and open. I am not a fan of this, this documentary or this trailer already because they're like, it's an unbiased. Like, really, dude? I know video editing, I know filming, I know cinematography and all of that. This is definitely biased. As an like, apologist, the minute and a half finding in, myself biased. confused by this movement. My own home church uh, was decimated by NAR teaching, and the church never really fully recovered from that. I'm painted as a leader. And of course, they're going to get people that have been hurt by Bethel or hurt by these churches, and they're going to interview them and say, oh, I was so hurt by this. That what that I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, Dr. Brown says he's painted as an NAR here, here. in NAR, and I don't believe any of those. Oh, well, let me rewind that. I messed it up here because I I paused it. <laughs> My own home church uh, was decimated by NAR teaching, and the church never really fully recovered from that. I'm painted as a leader in NAR, and I don't believe any of those things. We've seen a lot of pain come out of this movement. It was the first time I feel like I truly understood the gospel. And I was sold such a cheap bill of goods. This movement impacts Christianity at every fundamental doctrine of the faith. Standing in the office of the prophet of God. Now, how are we supposed to know whether an individual is a prophet? I execute you. So they're using Kenneth Copeland, which, by the way, Kenneth Copeland would be considered like word of faith, prosperity, not like a, a voice in the charismatic community or church. So again, like just poor representation, poor representation. Uh, it's just but Kenneth Copeland is not a voice in the charismatic church. That's news to me. I mean, as of uh, what, several weeks ago, uh, he was at Bethel ministering on their platform. Yeah, this is a huge topic, and I need to jump in here because I've been covering this a lot. Here's a video I made mid-year last year. Here's a video that came out in the fall. Here's a video that came out. Well, you see, my video actually got more views in two days than Kenneth Copeland's video from the Bethel Channel itself. And then Pastor Chris Valentin made a very strong statement in support of Kenneth Copeland, and I made that video. I also made this video showing the connection between Rodney Howard Brown at the beginning of all the uh, 1990s revivals and Kenneth Copeland. And then you see him again just recently working together with Jesse Duplantis promoting the Word of Faith Prosperity Gospel. These are all people who are very closely associated with both the Word of Faith movement and the New Apostolic Reformation. There's actually very little difference between the two. So 
um, again, word of faith has bled into the charis. It is part. It is. It is woven in to the the charismatic movement. There's no way to get around that, y'all. There's no way to get around that. It is within it. Um, so this is. You need to be aware of this. Um, recently, uh, Kenneth Copeland prophesied over Heidi Baker, um, and. You know, he has said some questionable, like not just questionable, unbiblical, blasphemous things throughout the years. So there's a reason why that he is mentioned in this. But here's the bigger reason that I want you to take note of when you watch this trailer. Because you need, just like you read the Bible in context, you need to look at this in context the way it's put together in this, even this extended trailer. What is going, what is being talked about right here in this section? It's talking about how you tell a difference between a prophet of God and a false prophet. How are we supposed to know what a, a false prophet is? This is a clear example of a false prophet. Kenneth Copeland stood on his own platform in 2020 and he cursed COVID and commanded it to die and said that it was going that it was dead, that it was that it was dying and that all these things were going to happen. He even blew it away on another uh, in another service. He blew it away. And what happened? What he said did not come to pass. So that is the that is the pinnacle of the the epitome <laughs> of a false prophet. That, that is one of the characteristics of a false prophet. When your prophecy does not come to pass, you are a false prophet. And this is why he is being used here as a prime example of a false prophet. But to say that he doesn't have any involvement in the charismatic church, um, been on stages with Rodney Howard Brown and and claiming to speak in tongues between the two of them. Um, again, it would be really good <laughs> to do your homework and to know what what's being said and what you're talking about when you when you do broach these subjects. So, um, yeah, that's I mean that is something that you need to be aware of. That's the reason why he's being mentioned in this particular clip. This is a this is a prime example of a false prophet. I had to come to the terms that I was not a prophet and I was also a false prophet. This is the sash that I received uh, the night I was released as an apostle. So if somebody were to say to you in the ancient world, I'm an apostle, the immediate question would be, well, who sent you? When a church changes its leadership structure to apostles and prophets, what follows is all this aberrant theology behind by the way, let me just make something clear because I'm definitely a big voice in the charismatic world and Pentecostal world. I do not know one person. This is for everyone in the chat. Listen closely. And the creator of this documentary, I do not know one person of all the apostles I know that claims to be like a modern, like a biblical apostle. It's a completely different context. No one I know is trying to write scripture, write canon, or believes there's some special superpower apostle or prophet. This is, again, a, in my opinion, the NAR thing is a conspiracy theory. Anybody that's charismatic, oh, you're NAR. Oh, you're NAR. We discredit you. You're NAR. And these, all of these people would consider me NAR. And I don't even know what, I had to go look up what the NAR is because they've so made this into this thing where it's like, if you believe in miracles, you're NAR. Okay. So let's say it again. Not all charismatics are new apostolic reformation. Okay. Just wanted to, to repeat that. <laughs> but I'm going to strongly disagree with Isaiah on this. Um, he's saying that all the apostles he knows, which that's problematic <laughs> when you say of all the apostles that I know, uh, there is a distinction that some people will make between the apostles of Christ. And there is a distinction, the apostles of Christ who walked with Jesus, who were with him in his earthly ministry, who saw his resurrection. Um, and Paul was one of those included because he had, he, the resurrected Christ, Jesus Christ after his resurrection came to Paul on the road to Damascus. And so he was an apostle of untimely birth is what he says in scripture. But I disagree with Isaiah. Uh, there are, in fact, apostles, people that believe they're apostles, should I say today, big A apostles that believe they have governing authority. We're praying, Lord, that this manifestation of your presence would be sustained, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, let us not mess it up. 
And thank you, Holy Spirit, you're not going to let us mess it up. We're going to ride this wave and we're going to flow with what you're doing organically. We're not going to me mechanize it. We're not going to ritualize it. And we're not going to put our hand on the cart to try to help it, Lord. We're not going to revivalize it. We're not going to apple. Apost uh, apostolically, we're not going to Pentecostalize it. Nothing, Lord. We are going to let you guide the ark and we're going to follow you like the Levites just carrying it on our shoulder. Father, I s provide apostolic seal of approval. Apostolic seal of approval. So what's happening there, I speak blessing over it. And I say, it's of God. And Father, I decree that you would bless it, that you would keep it, that you would make your face to shine upon it and be gracious unto it. And Lord, that you would lift up your countenance upon it and give it shalom. In Jesus' name. Wait a minute. Who are you? Stop it. Get some help. And if you don't listen to them and you question what they say, even in the slightest of way that you question them and you disagree with something, they will make an example out of you. Case in point. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm one of many that, that's been in this movement and has, it has had that happen. I am not an anomaly in this equation when you talk about the NAR. Now what I do find interesting is, this is the reason why I want to give pushback to what Isaiah said. He says, of all the apostles, he knows that none of them believe they have this type of authority. They don't believe they can write scripture. But what is ironic is that when you hear people say that they're an apostle, they believe that they have this authority. When you listen to their teachings and you read their books, you're going to find that they will reference verses in scripture that are talking about the apostles of Christ. When they talk about the apostolic still being here, the modern day apostolic, they are going to quote verses that apply to apostles of Christ. They don't quote about Barnabas. They don't quote about uh, the any of the other apostles to the church. Some people make that distinction. They don't talk about them. They focus on the verses pertaining to the big A apostles, the ones that had governing authority in the church, the ones that wrote scripture, which also, by the way, another thing to note, when apostles or prophets today that believe they have governing authority speak, they, they believe they're speaking on behalf of God. So when a prophet says, thus says the Lord, or the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity told me this, or God told me this, or Jesus walked into my room and breathed on me and commissioned me to write the Passion Translation, they are using examples, borrowing examples from scripture that look awfully similar to, for one thing, for what the apostles of Christ were with Jesus in his earthly ministry. Why would you use examples or say or make claims that Jesus came to you and you saw him face to face and then call yourself an apostle if you don't believe that you had the same authority as the apostles of Christ do in scripture. The other thing too is when you speak on behalf of God, when you prophesy and you claim to prophesy and you speak on behalf of God, God does not speak unauthoritatively. When God speaks, it's not something that we are to ignore and we are to just put on a shelf and think about it or to wonder if it was really God or not. God has had no problem speaking to people in Scripture, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament when He spoke to them. What He has revealed, He has given us His Word, and we need to value that and understand that it is God-breathed, it is God-speaking. We can be most assured of that, and it encourages us as believers in Christ, and we can know the way in which we are to walk. So I disagree with Isaiah on this matter, and I would encourage him and encourage you to continue to do research and not just on the fact of someone that you like saying it's a conspiracy theory. You need to read the books and to do the research to make sure that you know what is being stated and what is being believed. There's some good books out there too regarding the New Apostolic Reformation that show the material, the proof that is out there to show that this is indeed a movement that has grown tremendously through the years. She came up, you know, manifesting her laughter, <laughs> acting intoxicated. This goes back to April of 1993 when Rodney Howard Brown was visiting the Carpenters Church in Lakeland, Florida. <laughs> He's also this, known the as way, the... I don't do all the laughing. And all father that. of holy laughter. 
filled, 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 filled. And the Holy Ghost bartender. But I want you to know tonight the bar is open. If you were to be in the immediate presence of Christ, you, you wouldn't have a laughing revival. Do you not know our history? There's incidences of it happening under Finney, First and Second Great Awakening. Okay, so Randy Clark, Dr. Brown, they're going to be the voices of charismatics in the show. They're the ones that are like speaking on behalf of us saying like, hey, you guys are wrong in some of these areas. This happened when Pentecost came to Canada. A bizarre religious phenomenon called the Toronto Blessing. This is where you go to catch the fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit. There was laughter, there was joy, there was drunkenness in the Spirit. There's no biblical precedent for being drunk in the Holy Spirit. These things. There's also no biblical precedent for believing that the gifts have ceased. Just say. Isaiah said there's no precedent for the gifts ceasing. Well, there's also no precedent in Scripture that drunkenness is a gift. So that has nothing to do with the gifts. Um, there's a false equivocation there by bringing that up. Drunkenness is actually something that God abhors, um, the, the natural aspect of drunkenness. And as someone who was in this movement, I can, unfortunately, I can attest that I experienced this three, if not four times that I can remember in the past 18 years. And that is something that I have rejected and I have repented before the Lord. And I've asked him to forgive me for that. And I know that God has forgiven me for that behavior, but it didn't honor God. There was no good fruit that came from that. There's nothing of good in that that was of God that I can trace back to that, that produced spiritual maturity in my life. And that's a problem. And it's not based on my truth. As a Christian, I don't have that luxury. I'm to go back to the truth of scripture. And the truth of scripture is there's nothing in there that condones this behavior. There's nothing in there that tells us to act in such a way. And proof texting, like for example, from um, Ephesians 5.18 or from Acts 2, that does not um, endorse that behavior. And that's a misinterpretation of those scriptures. So as much as he wants to, to say things about cessationism, and listen, if he doesn't agree with cessationism, cessationism is a secondary issue among true born-again believers argument as far as spiritual gifts is concerned, uh, when you're talking about the hyper charismatic movement, I think that there could be an argument made that the gifts being presented um, do not match up with the gifts that are found in scripture. And that's a problem. Um, they are not matching up and agreeing with one another. So, I mean, when you consider that, um, when you consider that issue in and of itself, um, if they're not the same, then how are they biblical? And again, that's probably another topic for another day, but I did want to mention that, um, that that's a question that's raised. If the gift that you're saying uh, you have, um, the spiritual gift does not match up with the same one that we see in scripture, then how can it be the same one? So something to think about. Novel. <laughs> and that made the Toronto blessing incredibly controversial, even within charismatic circles. And I believe that the fruit of what happened vindicates that it was of God. But just what is revival? They've soft peddled God's warnings, have made the reality of hell a fairy tale. The, the Brownsville revival was the most sacred, glorious work I've ever been a part of in, in my life. We are not just bad people. That's our friend, Dr. We Michael are Brown. Sinners. Every single night, Jesus was exalted in worship. And until you realize you're a sinner, you will not realize you need a savior. Every single night calling for repentance from sin. But revivalism is when man tries to manufacture that. Uh, At any moment, revival could come. Bring revival! Yeah. Yeah. At any moment, revival can come. That's a bad thing to you? How are you going to make it bad? How are you going to be like, it's so bad to think that any moment revival can come? And they like... Why, why do some people hate revival? I don't understand this. They're people turning to God. You want them- Because they've never experienced Preach, preach. Yeah, so I think that we probably, all of us need to make sure that our definition of revival is the same because that word revival is not found in scripture. So we need to make sure that we understand biblically what it means to be revived. And that is for born again believers, by the way. Um, a sister in Christ and I were having this discussion today actually and talking about some of this with revival talk because it's big right now. And, um, you know, the, we're talking about how a born-again believer cannot be um, 
cannot be brought from death twice. We need to consider our definitions for words that we're um, ascribing to our spiritual walk with the Lord and make sure that they do match up with what Scripture shows. I mean, when you talk about revival, that you see that over and over again that the people of God were brought back to the commandments and instructions of the Lord, the written Word of God. Um, so, and then there was a comment that was made, well, you know, they've, they've never experienced it. Um, so that's why they hate revival. Um, so uh, another broad blanketed statement, um, that, uh, is unfounded and quite frankly, um, I'm, I'm going to say, again, I was someone that was in this this movement. Um, and I was, I went through, um, I can think of at least one, if not maybe two revival services and the, and then extended services and conferences and, 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 uh, intercessory prayer times and harp and bowl meetings. I mean, you name it, there's been things over the past years that I was involved in. And some of you may be, may can, can attest to this. Uh, just because once again, just because we say something out of concern, for these things that are going on does not mean that we've not ever had the the opportunities to be in these these claims of revivals these these extended meetings where um, the claim is that God is moving tremendously. That's just not true. Not true. And we have to look at lasting fruit from a person's life that testifies of Christ and testifies of the truth of his word because a true disciple of Christ is going to abide in his word. is going to have God's word written on their hearts and there's going to be true transformation that only God can do. Um, so there was that. And then he's going to say something here in just a minute. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. So let's keep listening to their um, response video. Yeah. I mean, religious people always condemn religion, yeah. condemn experience because they don't have them. Like, so if you don't have like experiences bitter. with yeah. God, I, I always say like, I would rather have strange fire than no fire. I mean, seriously. They're like, I would rather have strange fire than no fire. I mean, seriously. You know, John MacArthur makes his strange fire conference. I'm like, uh, you should rename it to no fire conference because we have people out here that are, they don't even know what the fire of God looks like, what the presence, the passion. These are young people hurting, broken. We just watch clips of revival and then we're going to put that in a negative light. Like, Bible is so no fire. I don't know if Isaiah really caught this, but it was really, um, uh, was it was really um, a, a, a negative remark towards him and those that with the strange fire conference in my understanding it was to address some of the the uh, practices and the teachings of the charismatic movement um, that are problematic in the history of it which I would encourage you to look into the history of, of these things and some of these individuals that have been revered as generals of the faith and I am well versed in in those and remember having to read Robert Lairdon's book when I was part of this movement um, and learning about God's generals the first volume installment of God's generals and the things that are said and the things that are left out um, there's some things that are left that are brought into so that they they're more humanized, you know, that, that makes it show that they are that they are human beings and that they were fallible. Um, but at the same time, they're very much propped up on pedestals to make it look like these are great men and women of God, and we need to we need to get a hold of their mantles. We need to carry on and do what they're doing, and we need to have that fire. And let me also say this, because so that that's what I wanted to say is when he says, "How about no fire?" Well, the strange fire wasn't referring to um, the reform people that were talking about it, it was talking about the people in the charismatic movement that, that go to these extremes that are doing these, these aberrant practices. Um, so that's actually a knock when he says that about no fire. And we need to understand what that means about the fire of God. In Matthew 3 11, when it talks about that, um, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. If you read that in context, the fire is actually judgment. Um, so I know that God can refine us, um, spiritually speaking, through trials that seem like we're going through fire. I, I understand that. But again, it, knowing what Scripture says is going to be really important to you. And and I can attest again and say that in this movement, I was biblically illiterate. And when you're biblically illiterate, you'll believe anything. And you'll be deceived very easily. And you'll listen to people 
that have no business teaching you things and they are hirelings and they will teach you things that are not found in scripture in the proper context. And it is so vital that you read scripture on your own and that you read verses before and after a verse that's quoted to you in a service or on online uh, videos that you're listening to. You need to make sure that you are being a good student of the word because you are responsible for your biblical knowledge and your biblical understanding. And you're not going to be able to claim ignorance and, and claim that that you didn't know any better. If you're a Christian, then one of the things that you do to fellowship with God is that you stay in the word of God daily. And that you know what his word says, that you won't be blown around by every wind of doctrine that comes through. I want to encourage you in that, that you read your Bible. You don't just... Um, entrust someone else to feed you what the Word of God says. And you do need to be going to um, to not forsaking the gathering of the assembly. You need to be in a local church that's biblically sound. But you need to be feasting on the Word every day and reading it for yourself and studying it, making sure that you understand what it says and, and asking God to help you to grow in spiritual maturity and that you can glorify Him and minister the gospel. You cannot minister the gospel based on your experiences and on your personal testimony. You minister the gospel through Scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Romans 10, 17 in the context is talking about the gospel. It's not talking about you have enough faith in your words to, to name it and claim it. It's not talking about anything else other than the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the atonement of your sins and my sins and to give us the ministry of reconciliation and the promise of eternal life through faith alone in Christ alone also say this about strange fire real quick before I forget. That is a reference to the Old Testament for the sons of Aaron uh, that brought strange fire before God. And what happened to them? They were killed by God. They were destroyed because they did not obey God. And so talking about the fire of God is not something that we want to take lightly. It's around the corner. You're constantly chasing after it. And so I thought, yeah, we chase God. Of course, we're always chasing God. The Bible says to pursue him. The Bible says to pursue the gifts. So they tell us, don't pursue the gifts, but the God I'm pursuing tells me to pursue the gifts and to pursue him and to pursue the miracles. So it's so bizarre to me that the Bible literally says to chase and pursue God. And you're telling us like, we shouldn't be chasing around. Now, I know what the intention was in that segment because I was in the segment. We were talking about this revivalism. This need to always want something bigger and better and more than what you currently have in your current Christian life, in your current church, and how this leads to this sense of never being satisfied, and it actually hurts the local church. It actually hurts your relationship with God when you think that there's always something bigger and better around the corner. That's what we were referring to. I want you to notice the great confidence that Isaiah has in what he's saying. The Bible literally says to chase and pursue God. But it doesn't say that. Just like Chris Roseboro, I'm calling him on it. There are verses that say to seek after God or to pursue God, but there are no verses that say we should chase after God. I typed it in and seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. That's, that's good. That's not having anything to do with getting in the car and driving to the next meeting, the next super special meeting where guys like Isaiah Saldivar are speaking. But the Bible isn't telling us to go to all these revivals. It's not expecting us to go to these revivals. It doesn't even mention these revivals. But because Isaiah is equating any kind of revival meeting with seeking God himself, well, it makes it look like this is a trailer that's opposed to people being close to God or becoming saved or anything like that. I'm going to keep chasing. Thought, well, I don't want to miss the next revival. And what if it comes in a manner that we're not used to seeing and we miss it? Pastors orchestrated first revival. You cannot plan a revival any more than you can plan a hurricane. And Amen. this thing just kind of spread all over the world. I remember in 1996, we had guys from Toronto come to India. And so in Mumbai, we had something called Catch the Fire. Bill Johnson says he caught the fire and he came back to ready. I believed it was God, so I'm taking the seatbelts off. I'm jumping head first. I was ready. I had my hands up. I was like, today's the day. I'm about to fall out in the spirit. Here it goes. And they hit my stomach and nothing happens. And I'm like. They shouldn't be hitting your stomach. I mean, we don't hit people. Y'all well, out there, you need to stop hitting people. Don't be hitting. Yep. Don't be pushing. 
God doesn't need your Don't help. Push them to the ground. You can just gently lay your hand on them. I usually won't even do that, but pushing people to the ground no, and going WWF not. style out here, like this is not. <laughs> we're not out here wrestling. We're out here praying for people. Like when people pray, they literally yeah, like pushing and all that. Throw them I, on the I ground. I don't get down with the pushing. Do not push. I'm like, you do not need to like yank me to the ground. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't do that out here. Do it again. Just. Ugh. Do I think some people got in the flesh? Let's get the fun back into <laughs> church. I thought this is the Holy Spirit, and this is how He moves. More Lord. The Bible says. And of course, they're going to take all the most extreme yeah, 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 yeah. sides of charismatic. They're not. And the thing is, if they just showed normal charismatics, like we, it wouldn't make the video because it's not as exciting to them. So they have to show the most extreme. Like I don't get down with all that, and they, they have to show all of that because uh, <laughs> it's just. He said, "I got beat up at a no fire conference." Yeah, it's. Just crazy. <laughs> so once again, <laughs> let's go over this again, shall we? The focus of this film. This docu-series is on the hyper-charismatic church. The hyper-charismatic church. <laughs> I want to reiterate that because they, they've made a point, and I understand that they're bringing this point out. They're saying, well, y'all are taking the most extreme examples. Yes, because this is in the hyper-charismatic church. This stuff is looks normal to me. This looks normal because of what I came out of. This is, no, this is not uncommon. So that's great. You know, I don't agree with Isaiah on the whole deliverance ministry issue. And if you've heard my podcast and, and seen the videos I've done about it, it's because biblically what they believe does not line up with scripture because of, of the premise of deliverance ministry that they continue to perpetuate. But I'm glad that he believes that this is extreme. Great. But that still, it's part of the charismatic church. It's a part of it. It's not the whole as a whole, but this is part of it. And it has to be addressed and acknowledged. Sorry. <laughs> the fruit of the spirit is self-control. I try to barely, barely, barely. <laughs> the question is, is oh, yeah, what is the barely. source of these? Another well-known cessationist who doesn't believe God speaks to people. Who also does it, and I'm it's not like, trying to make this a slander. I video. know, but that's just that's so boring. That's so boring. But also, d doesn't believe God speaks people. Doesn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Supernatural. Do I think some of the manifest supernatural through the lives stations was not of God? God wouldn't do that. Why would God do that? And it felt like a bolt of electricity hit me in the chest. Not just me. The two ushers with me. It was as though a thousand volts of electricity is going through me. The minute I took one step in the fire tunnel, I felt so. It, so they're basically saying like how they're trying to make it sound like it's so crazy that you felt like electricity. It's God. Who knows what God feels like? The Bible says the mountains shake at His presence. So maybe you will shake. Maybe you will fall. Maybe you do feel electrocuted. But how are you going to get mad at someone saying they felt they got electrocuted? I mean, I don't overwhelmed. Know. With regards to the feeling of electrocution, this is not something that we see in Scripture. And proof texting a, a passage that says nothing about this, but talks about that the mount, mountains shake at the presence of God, that doesn't have any bearing on th these experiences that are being attested to. And if anything, I know sisters in Christ who came out of the New Age and are born-again believers, and they've actually talked about that these um, these accounts of feeling this electricity through your body, that that is more akin to New Age practices than it is biblical Christianity. So, it, it does matter. I mean, we have to use the Bible in context. And again, our experiences do not interpret Scripture. Our experiences are tested and judged by Scripture. And if our experiences do not match up with the authority, the foundation upon which, upon which we rest for the truth, this is the standard that we go back to for truth, then we have a problem. And we need to acknowledge it and address it and be willing to reject and repent if necessary, before the Lord and to have our minds renewed by the Word of God. Like sense of fear. Do I think some of the manifestations was actually demonic? Yes, 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 yes. And as soon as she pulls her hand away from me, she looks at me and she says, you have unforgiveness in your heart. What we really are doing is we're manipulating people. Did it have its issues? A hundred percent. But the fruit of what God did in Toronto is evident globally. And I can point to hundreds, if not thousands, of testimonies of the amazing things, including my own life, that God did through Toronto. 
If you want to see the real power of God unleashed, it's not in fake signs and wonders. The real power of God is the gospel. Well, how, how, who are you to say they're fake? How are you going to say, well, and how are you going to call signs and wonders that you, don't, you weren't even there fake signs and wonders? Like, that's a bit scary to me. Like, to say these are fake signs and wonders would be to say that you're God. I mean, how can you discern and say these are fake? Like, indefinitely, these are fake signs and wonders when you weren't even there. And that's the thing about revival and even the charismatic movement is we step out and take risks. So, of course, anytime you step out and take risks, there's going to be failure. There's going to be people, stuff happening. There's going to be in anything. But if you're never jump, stepping out of the boat and taking risks, of course, there's going to be no fail. There's no mess. You're not literally not doing anything. You're just like, well, I'm just going to read the Bible all day. And it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. And I think we've gotten to a time where we've worshipped the Scripture and not worshipped the God of the Scripture. We don't pray to the Bible. We don't bow down to the Bible. We don't worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. And we believe that he can do what he did there still today. Like, how do you read the Bible and go, how do you read the Bible and go, I don't know if this stuff happens anymore. Like, what are you, what are you reading? It's not, it's crazy. John? That's not the first time that I've heard that statement. I'm sure some of you have heard it as well. Well, it's not the Father, Son, and the Holy Bible. <sighs> and I find this statement problematic because it's a misrepresentation of those of us that are, again, calling things into question. And obviously, we do acknowledge that the Trinity is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What's concerning to me is when someone makes this statement that they are diminishing and denigrating the Word of God. I thought that the Word of God was authoritative, and I thought that it was something that we are to look to. And that, that statement in and of itself, um, the, the problem with it is that um, we have been left with God's Word, and we need to value it and obey it. Just because we call for obedience to it and to refer back to it for the standard of truth does not mean that we worship it, but we acknowledge that it is God speaking and that it matters. Um, and if you want to know how we can rightly discern what is truth and what is error, um, what are the signs and wonders and, of God and what are not, then guess what, guys? You have the Bible. We have the Bible that we can go to, to know those things and to rightly discern, to rightly test, to see if glitter coming out of air vents is actually in Scripture, as opposed to seeing that there is gold dust mentioned in Scripture, and um, it was in the book of Exodus when the golden calf that was an idol was ground up and put into water for the Israelites to drink because of their idolatry and their sin against God. Um, God has established his boundaries for his people, and those boundaries are found in Scripture. You cannot know what those boundaries are if you don't read the Bible, if you don't study the Bible, and you know what it says. And this is part of our fellowship with God. And it's really troubling when I hear professing believers make these statements about Scripture um, and diminishing the Word of God while wanting to hear a fresh word from God. They want something new and fresh, so it's essentially treating Scripture like it's stale, like it's old, and, and we don't need that anymore. We, we need something new and fresh and exciting, and that's dangerous. That's a dangerous practice to get into, and it, it leads to unbiblical and, uh, and, and ungodly ways when we do that, when we are going outside the parameters of Scripture to know what the truth is. So Jesus made it clear that we are to abide in His Word. And true disciples abide in the Word of God. John 8, 31, He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, if you are my disciples, you will abide in my Word. And you will know the truth, in 32, and the truth will set you free. And so it's important that we stay in the Word and that we not give in to these uh, little pithy statements of, well, it's not the Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. If you have a problem with Scripture as a born-again believer, as a professing born-again believer, then the problem is not with the Bible. The problem is with you. And the problem is not with the person that's pointing you back to Scripture. The problem lies with you, if that's an issue for you. G. Lake is... This is the extended trailer. You're like, longest trailer ever? Yes. I know, that's what I've seen. This is the extended trailer. <laughs> yeah, the, the regular one's like three minutes, and it's... Presented. This is a longer trailer because there's so much extensive material in this, and it's a docu-series. It's not just a film. It's a docu-series. It's going to be at least 10 episodes, I think, the last thing that I heard about this. So, I mean, again, trying to be thorough and trying to be fair and objective, but guess it's not. 
according to Isaiah. As being this phenomenal healer credited Second with we hundreds of thousands yes. of healings, <laughs> miracles, <laughs> visions, prophecies. I said, God, would you give me... The <laughs> well, Alyssa's breaking out into some holy laughter right now. Hold on. No, this isn't the movie. I guess it's a docu-series coming out. I hope, I hope it's not as biased as this trailer. Is it, this is for, do, you think this is, do you think this is biased? No. Who in the chat thinks this is unbiased? Like they said, oh, no, this, is, this is biased. They're like, this is unbiased. I'm like, you're literally putting like every crazy dramatic clip you can find and making it seem so terrible. The mantle like, of William Branham. I was born and raised in the Branham message cult following. This was a movement that was not of God in any way, shape or form. It's been said that those who are cessationists believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Scripture. I just said that! He just quoted me. And we've essentially ruled out the role and function of the Holy Spirit. Skip that. But oh. nothing could be farther from the truth. I absolutely believe that God still physically heals people today. I believe God can do miracles. I believe he will do. This is what they all say. Cessationists, please. This is my plea to you. Stop saying, I absolutely believe God, but you just don't believe he can do it through people. Like, I don't understand this. You believe God can do it, but God can't work through a person. His spirit can't move through a person. When you preach, you're literally speaking the words of God. You're speaking on behalf of God. We're God's ambassadors, the Bible says. So they all will say, we believe in miracles. It's only if God decides sovereignly he wants to do them. Yet all throughout the scripture, God was working through people. The entire Bible is literally God working through mankind, even in the Old Testament. And how much of a greater covenant now the Holy Spirit's not on us. He's in us. Would God not work through Do people? Miracles. Ambassadors of what? The gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not ambassadors of our personal testimony or our personal experiences or telling of these radical encounters that we've had with God and or that we think that we've had with God or these radical experiences and having gold dust and um, all kinds of and feathers and all kinds of things that have happened. We're ambassadors of Christ, which is proclaiming the gospel. You cannot proclaim the gospel apart from scripture. Isn't that nice? See how that ties together. It's just beautiful. It's beautiful. But yes, it is possible to um, acknowledge and say, well, the gifts were for a certain time. Uh, those specific gifts, the apostolic gifts were for a certain time, which I do not believe that there are modern day apostles and prophets today. I don't. Um, I do believe that they're, that they're still ministering to us through scripture when we read because the Holy Spirit carried these men along, according to 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, to write the scriptures. This is the more sure word of prophecy. I do believe that. I believe that whenever I read the word of God, that God is speaking and that he's ministering to me. And by his spirit, that I am understanding scripture better and better, more and more every day, so that I can be a godly wife, a godly mother, that I can be the disciple of Christ that I need to be to proclaim his word, to minister to other women, to minister to my children, to be um, to be uh, uh, that disciple that glorifies Christ. And I still believe that God heals, and I still believe that God does miracles. But I don't know anybody today that has the gift of healing or the gift of miracles statement I found very interesting. And the reason why I found it interesting was because Isaiah says, well, it's a better covenant, basically, that, you know, God is not just on us, but he's in us. Yes, and amen. So explain how if God is in us now, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is in us. Since he is, I shouldn't say if, since he's in us, why is it that there is a teaching in areas of the charismatic movement that state that prophecy can be fallible? that healings are progressive, that born-again Christians can have indwelling demons and plain word semantics with the Greek word that talks about being demon-possessed, not demonized, which is an English translation that was added, but the Greek is actually translated as demon-possessed. Why is it that since we're under a better covenant that it's worse? According to some of the teachings that are coming out of these, these areas of the charismatic movement, Something to think about. But only when it is uh, his sovereign will to do so. He's already revealed his will. His will is to heal everyone. But there's something about hearing a physician <laughs> say to you, I think that you'll be lucky to have six months. It's hard to hear. It is 
really hard to hear. Christ is the ascended king. He has triumphed. We share in that triumph. That doesn't mean that we stand in front of graves and call people out of their graves. The book of Acts is not given to us to attempt to reenact. The real question... What? Why not? The book of Acts was not given to us to, to attempt to reenact. Why, why can't we live out what, what they did there? There's no amen to it. Is I, I don't understand. What is normative? My guest has raised 37 people from the dead. Where's the proof of this? I do know people who raised more people from the dead than Jesus did. Jesus didn't do miracles to show us what God could do. Jesus' statement is not that hard to understand. Greater means greater, and the works he referred to are signs and wonders. He didn't perform miracles to show what he could do. It's meant to make you think that you are at the same level of Jesus. Nobody thinks that. Speaking as a leader in the charismatic movement, nobody thinks that they're the same. Whatever he did, I can do. He came to illustrate. I mean, he said we're going to do the same works. John 14, 12. The same works I do, you're going to do. And even greater. So like, people are like, I can't believe you think you can do the things Jesus did. He literally told us the same works I've done, you're going to do. I, I'm like, what do you mean? He literally said it and even greater. What a human being could do. He performed miracles to show what you can do. And the more that happens through Christians, it doesn't detract from what Jesus did. Christ is unique. It brings glory to the main work that he did. They can't duplicate Amen. these miracles no matter how hard they try. Maybe we're not reading the New Testament correctly. I would say one of the greatest sins is the church just sitting in a pew, building Preach. this, yeah. and not actually going and doing what Jesus actually did. Yes. And not going to the poor, the sick, the needy, and the broken. Everybody skips over those verses. Apostolic anointing. And so we just rip it right out of the ground. We just suck it right off his... That guy, this guy's a complete heretic. Everybody knows that. Is it John Crowder, I think his name is? Something like that. He's a, considered a mystic. He's absolutely crazy. I, I never call people heretics. I'll go on record saying this guy's an absolute heretic. He tokes the ghost. He shoots up in his arm the Holy Spirit. He does all the most disgusting, bizarre things you can think of. He's definitely not. He's definitely not. Like, how are you going to put this dude in the documentary? Like, dude, this guy. They this always guy, need the extreme. Yeah, this guy's an absolute heretic. This guy's not a charismatic. He calls himself a mystic. So, yes. <laughs> This is crazy. Uh, grave soaking is terrible. I would never do that. I'm just telling you, this guy's not the He's guy. Dead. To so thank you, Isaiah, for agreeing that, that John Crowder is highly problematic and that he has heretical teaching. And also, thank you for denouncing grave soaking. But John Crowder's not the only one that does grave soaking. Bethel has done that, including some of their leaders have done it. There's photos of them that have done it. They've tried to denounce it and do some cleanup with it along with some other issues that they've had at Bethel. But nevertheless, it's stuff that's gone on and it's been perpetuated by students in Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry to get the anointing, to reference and proof text Elisha's bones and trying to suck up the mantle or get something off of the graves. These things go on. Again, this is not a charismatic thing across the board. This is in the hyper charismatic movement. Now, thank the Lord, I did not do anything like this. Um, but there were still other wacky stuff that I participated in that's still, you know, thinking that you, a, a handkerchief that someone prays on that like Oral Roberts or somebody that it had the anointing in it from Oral Roberts and it was something super special. You know, things like that, that again, they do not align with sound biblical Christianity, sound biblical teaching um, that, that Christians should be adopting and practicing. And so, yes, we would agree on John Crowder. We would not agree that this is not, again, again, an attack uh, uh, saying pull up the most extreme cases. This is in the hyper charismatic church. And let me also remind you, you said he was a mystic. Um, there's people in the charismatic, hyper charismatic movement that identify as mystics. I can name two of them um, that are very well known right off the bat. Charlie Champ and James Gall identify as mystics. And they would be classified in the hyper charismatic church it, within the charismatic movement. So being a mystic does not put you outside of this camp. And it is, in fact, relevant. Oh, in Jesus name. <laughs> I don't think you have to be a cessationist, for example, to be concerned about adopting new age and or pagan and occult practices. OK, and this is whack right here. So as an apostolic with the authority. 
Like, why are we, why are we out charismatics? Why are you out here doing this stuff? You're making us, you're making us look terrible. Getting a Gandalf staff. This was this video. They're I literally, this video. yes, I they got it. they got a staff. They said, just like Gandalf got his staff, we're gonna end uh, racism. Is, yeah. Yeah, this this may, this is terrible. I do not so, no to this. Are we not gonna have like a premiere meetup for this movie? No, we're not. We're not. <laughs> we do not advocate so far. I mean, maybe maybe it'll be good, but as of right now, it's extremely biased. They say, oh, it's gonna be unbiased. No, it's not. But this is story crazy. that God's given to us. Yeah. They really believe they're apostles, and they believe they have apostolic authority. We decree and declare that racism will end. It's it's blasphemous and sad. Thinking somehow they can recreate a scene from the Lord of the Rings. And in defense oh. of the people making this documentary, they actually didn't take that out of context. They actually said, the way, did, she yeah. actually said, the way Gandalf yeah. slammed his staff to end whatever, we're going to say what Gandalf said and we're going to make racism not pass. I kid you not. So they did not take this out of context. It's actually as crazy as they said. And it, I think this is wrong. I think this is weird and wrong. They definitely didn't take this out of context. And if the NAR is real, which I don't think it is, then this is definitely NAR, but we don't, we don't do this. This is weird. So... Yeah, th this again, um, I'm, I appreciate the fact that he doesn't agree with this and sees that it's highly problematic. And he makes the statement, you know, if this is NAR, you know, if this is this is NAR and we're not part of this. Well, this is a prime example of apostles. If you notice who's on stage, Shayon is up there, Bill Johnson, El Ed Silvestro's on up there. There's several individuals that are up there that identify as apostles. They identify as apostles. And the whole act of this was they believe they have apostolic authority. If you listen to the entire clip of that reenactment from Lord of the Rings that they did as a prophetic act, they believe that they have governing authority. Um, this was pre-planned. The, the, the ones that participated in this, they knew what was going to happen. They were aware of what was going to take place. So to try to, to downplay that, no, they knew what was going to happen. And so this is an example of apostles, people that believe they're apostles, taking governing authority within the church, within the body of Christ, and saying as a whole, the body of Christ, the spirit of racism, we're taking authority over it. Thou shall not pass. Well, it did pass because guess what? Racism is a sin. Hatred against someone else because of the color of their skin is a sin. It's not a spirit. It's a sin problem, and sin needs to be dealt with through the cross, through the blood of Jesus, and repentance. Repent on that for your individual sin, not a, a, a systemic thing or anything like that, or uh, uh, repenting on behalf of your ancestors for generational curses or anything. This is a sin problem individually that needs to be addressed, and the only way to combat this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Do you feel like yeah, they you really backed into a boring, dead form of Christianity when you moved out of the NAR movement? No, if anything, I came to life. How was I so prideful? How was I so entitled? I think he was the Bethel student that was came out of that and was like, I don't know what he's saying. I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you. Yeah, uh, all the people in that clip did it. Uh, with the Holy Spirit and with it. fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff <laughs> with unquenchable fire. Oh, is this your... Good to see you. Good to see you too. Josh Lewis is a friend of mine, Remnant Radio. I've been on his show several times. He's a uh, charismatic. So, but yeah, stationist, I guess he's continuationist. Stationist. Yes. Best buddies. Tell the people how it happened, I guess. This isn't about Pentecostalism versus Reformed theology. This is about misrepresenting something beautiful and edifying and sovereignly given by the Holy Spirit. So there were more uh, at the end of the video of the actual trailer, which we're not going to talk about. They, these were actually rebuttal videos that Michael Brown and um, Randy Clark and another individual, another gentleman presented and, and shared why they were part of the docuseries. But I wanted to cover basically the extended trailer and to present 
my rebuttal to Isaiah's rebuttal. So I hope that this has been helpful to you. And if you follow Isaiah, I hope that you will consider what I've shared with you today, that you will do your own due diligence and that you will um, watch the trailer for yourself, consider watching the docu-series for yourself and um, asking the tough questions, examining your own life personally to make sure that it lines up with what scripture says, that, that you understand what the, the true gospel is according to scripture, not according to experience, not according to what someone else's opinion is, but according to what scripture says is the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the atonement of your sin. And I hope that you will have um, ears to hear what I'm saying and that you will um, go back and test these things for yourself, including what I'm saying. Make sure that it matches up with what scripture says. And if you want to check out any of my interviews to see where I came from and have more information, you can certainly do that. I have playlists um, on my channel and one of the playlists includes the interviews that I've done. So thank you for your time and I hope you have a wonderful evening. And if you're watching this over the weekend, I hope you have a blessed weekend. Catch you next time.